Hello, and a very warm welcome to our Empowering a Sustainable Future breakout session. We hope you enjoyed the North American Innovation Forum plenary session today, and thank you for joining us. I'm Katherine Berger, Content Head, BFSI Platforms for TCS, and I'll be your host for this session today. Financial institutions are increasingly are responding to stakeholder demands for sustainability and environmental, social, and governance, or ESG, actions by articulating a corporate purpose and explaining how that purpose will drive their decision making. The Paris Agreement stipulates that countries make finance flows consistent with a pathway toward low greenhouse gas emissions and climate resilient development. Consequently, the onus is on financial institutions to enable a sustainable transition to a greener economy by incorporating sustainability goals into their business strategies. Creating a sustainable future will require financial institutions to play a pivotal role. Calibrated actions by these institutions through different lenses by galvanizing the larger ecosystem will be essential to empower the decision to a sustainable global economy. Let's take a look at today's agenda. First, we will hear opening remarks from Kay Krithivasan, President, Banking, Financial Services and Insurance from TCS. Then we will have a great fireside chat on sustainable and responsible investments. This will be moderated by Subramani and Kapuswamy, Global Head, Sustainable Banking and Investments, BFSI for TCS. Subramani will be joined by Raman Srivastava, EVP and Global Chief Investment Officer for Great West Life Co. This will be followed by our panel discussion, Sustainability, BFSI Empowers the World for a Resilient Future. The panel, panel will be moderated by Zishan Rashid, Global Head, Climate Change Advisory, Industry Advisory Group, BFSI for TCS. Zishan will be joined by three amazing guests from the Auto Club Group, KeyBank, and Comerica Inc. We will end today's session with closing remarks from Ram V, Chief Technology Officer, Banking, Financial Services, and Insurance for TCS. At the bottom of your screen, you will see a row of widget icons. These control the various windows, which are resizable and movable by clicking on the arrows in the top right corner. So feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop. For a better experience during the panel discussion, you may want to maximize the, the video window to full screen. We will be answering some of your questions as part of the Q&A session. So please use the Q&A box below to submit your questions. Please remember, you do not need to wait until the end of the presentation to submit your questions. Also, please be sure to fill out the event survey. You can do this anytime during the event. Finally, in today's virtual world, it's not uncommon to experience a technical glitch. If your screen buffers or freezes, just refresh your browser page. In most cases, that resolves common technical issues. You can also use the Q&A box to post any login or tech-related issues and our support team will try its best to resolve them. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Kay Krithivasan. Kay Krithivasan is president of the Banking, Financial Services, and Insurance Business Group for TCS. In this role, he is responsible for planning and executing growth strategy, financial performance, enhancing customer mind share, and also associate development. Krithi has over 30 years of global experience in the IT industry. He has worked in diverse roles ranging from delivery management, relationship management, large program management, and sales across different markets. Krithi also has led e-business delivery across TCS, where he was responsible for establishing consistent delivery practices and governance for all large e-business programs. He is also a member of the board of directors of TCS Latin America. Krithi holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Madras and a master's degree in industrial and management engineering from IIT Kanpur. Welcome, Prithi. Thanks, Kathy. Good afternoon and good evening, everyone. I would like to welcome all of our esteemed guests to the Banking, Financial Services and Insurance Breakout session. As discussed in the plenary session, today there is no greater challenge facing humanity than the environmental degradation of our planet. The core purpose of financial services industry is to help businesses grow and create wealth. 
but this is undermined by the uncertainty and disruption caused by significant climate driven disasters of which we are witness to an increasing number around the world sustainable business growth and prosperity require certainty of operations events such as climate emergency inequity and political turmoil societal tensions etc disrupt this certainty and impede global well being the financial services industry has the ability and the responsibility in addressing these challenges and thereby ensuring a sustainable development of global economies in light of the many climate disasters that we have seen playing out over the past months from the deadly floods in germany the one in a thousand year rain in china the impact of hurricane ida on the us east coast and so much more it is imperative for business to plan for this new operating environment the unprecedented is very much the new normal the entire world has just gone through and continues to suffer the impact of an extreme biological event over the past couple of years and scientists are already alerting us of more such potential disasters financial services industry overall has to do everything possible to first mitigate the circumstances that lead to such major disruptions and second to adapt to the possibility of such events through more flexible supply chains and operational models the financial services industry has the opportunity to play the role of a watchdog in ensuring all new investments are aligned to goals that minimize the impact of industry on the environment and to incentivize business models and innovation that addresses the sustainable goals and deficit faced by the society across the world that may mean for example the investments new and current in coal and other carbon based technologies is curtailed while that in newer green renewable forms of energy generation is encouraged financial services firms should develop financial products and services that further the green agenda by individual and enterprises globally the power to effect the change exists and can be channelized through collective efforts towards this imperative additionally the bfsa sector must take a lead role in demonstrating the power of technology to transform our own operation from green building and facilities to minimize paper through an emphasis on digital modes of records and transactions we must also push our stakeholders including employees customers and vendors to likewise step up efforts to ensure greener production and consumption the financial services industry needs to do all in its power pragmatically to pivot towards green technologies as quickly as possible at tcs we are undertaking significant efforts to support our clients in the banking financial services and insurance industry by leveraging the best technologies that can help our clients move as fast as possible towards a net zero and even a net negative operational environment tcs itself has committed to net zero emissions by 2030 with 70% reductions in absolute greenhouse gas emissions across scope 1 and scope 2 by 2025 at the core of tcs strategy to reduce its carbon footprint is improved energy efficiency through the addition of more green buildings to the company's real estate portfolio reduction of it systems power usage and the use of tcs clever energy which leverages iot machine learning and ai to optimize energy consumption across campuses you will hear a lot more in the sessions to come on topics that align to this agenda i would like to thank you all for joining this breakout session which includes a fireside chat and a panel discussion on sustainability in addition to many other interesting topics with this i hand it back to kathy thanks kathy Thank you, Krithi. You provided some very insightful context for the rest of today's program. Let's move on now to our fireside chat and introduce our next speakers. Subramanian Kapaswamy is the global head of sustainable banking and investments for TCS's BFSI Business Group. Subi has over 25 years of sales, solution development, and technology experience in banking and financial services. With a passion for sustainability. Subi enjoys working in the intersection of sustain, sustainability and ESG business and technology, championing TCS's efforts in externalizing its sustainability capabilities 
and crafting differentiated solutions to address the rapidly emerging needs in this space. Welcome, Suvi. Raman Srivastava is Executive Vice President and Global Chief Investment Officer for Great West Life Co. Raman oversees investment teams in Canada, the US and Europe. He joined Great West Life Co. in 2017 and leads a global team of investment professionals in setting strategic direction and delivering investment results across a diverse global investment platform, including the insurance general accounts and third-party funds. Raman earned a Master of Science in Computational Finance from Carnegie Mellon University and a Bachelor of Mathematics degree from the University of Waterloo. Raman is a Chartered Financial Analyst Charter Holder. Welcome, Raman. Over to you, gentlemen. Thank you, Catherine, uh, and welcome, Raman. Uh, it's wonderful to have you with us uh, today for the session. Thanks, Yuvi. Thanks for having me. Uh, as Kriti highlighted, uh, Raman, uh, the you know, financial inst institutions around the globe are increasingly responding to uh, stakeholder demands on sustainability by articulating a corporate purpose and actively pursuing um, ESG-driven investment strategies. And at a time when uh, in the investment industry itself is facing the challenges of increasing uh, regulatory expectations and clients looking for a greater transparency on where their money is invested and in the impact of their investments, I believe sustainable and responsible investing is no longer a very niche option and is becoming mainstream as well. And what we have seen in the past 12 months, uh, you know, with the purpose-led ESG linked companies showing better performance, we've also seen financial institutions have started to uh, structure their investment for portfolios with increased emphasis on uh, ESG. Now seeking to invest into companies that exhibit uh, strong ESG practices and uh, commitments. So Raman, uh, in your view, what opportunities does this present to investment management firms and uh, asset managers? Yeah, thanks, Subin. I think you, you you raised all the right issues there. It's definitely, and I love the theme of this um, conference as well in terms of innovation, because I think this is one area where um, asset managers do need to be innovative. Uh, when I think about what we are hearing from clients, um, I mean, there's definitely opportunities. I think there's challenges as well. The you know, what we're hearing is there is no one size fits all solution in this respect. So you need to be flexible as a manager, you know, understand that the needs of clients can be different. Um, I think increasingly clients um, and other stakeholders are asking for very clear proof statements. Um, and that can be challenging because the data and metrics around this space um, are difficult to navigate, sometimes inconsistent. Uh, so I think the data challenge is, is real. Um, and then, of course, you have the regulatory challenge. You know, the, the regulatory requirements are evolving quickly. They are not exactly always consistent um, jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, so that can be a challenge. But but having said that, you know, if you're able to deliver um, an innovative, customized solution that meets a client's need in this space, you have the metrics and data to back it up. You obviously meet the regulatory requirements. I think it's a big opportunity in the years ahead for, for asset managers. I think we're just scratching the surface of, of the opportunities in this space. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, uh, glad that you brought up the regulatory um, part of it as well, because I was going to go there. And anyway, you know, with emerging trends such as SEC, SEC now pushing for more transparent and uh, ESG and climate disclosures, we believe it's only a matter of time before we move towards more hard regulations from the current voluntary alignment. And in my view, you know, this entails a very comprehensive and holistic approach to define an ESG strategy and integrate uh, ESG factors into research and decision making. So specifically, you know, how are you addressing uh, and adapting to these uh, evolving guidelines and regulations? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're definitely evolving. And we, we try as best as we can to take a, a very active role in the discussion. So, you know, we're, we're regularly engaging with policymakers. Um, we're meeting with, um, you know, different uh, regulatory bodies across the different regions in, in which we participate. And what we try and do is, is always encourage as much as possible, global consistency, because, you know, as a manager, it can be really difficult to have, you know, to try and um, adhere to, to regulations in different jurisdictions which are quite different. Um, so we try and encourage global uh, consistency, recognizing that the needs, you know, say of the SEC in, in the U.S. will be different than that in, in Europe. Um, but when we take inventory of the, you know, the different frameworks, the standards, um, the different regulatory requirements that exist, uh, across the different jurisdictions, what we do find are there what's emerging are probably 10 to 15 key data points or metrics uh, that we think will likely shape uh, disclosure or regulatory requirements over the coming years, um, almost regardless of jurisdiction. So, 
Um, so there, you know, we are focused initially on, on standing up those. Uh, and, you know, a lot of those are actually coming out of uh, initially out of Europe in the what's called the SFDR or the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Requirements. Absolutely. So as you as you pointed out, I mean, uh, we also see that, you know, um, in all these uh, emerging regulations uh, and uh, with the way uh, things are done, we see that environment and climate related performances and disclosures, of course, get a very line share of uh, focus in sustainable investment strategies. But uh, are you looking beyond E and uh, are you trying to consider the social and governance KPIs such as, you know, diversity or inclusion or equality? transparency while considering your uh, you know the sustainability performance of the businesses in your strategies yeah it's interesting the i think when you think about es and g i think for for a lot of years the primary focus was on the e you know so the vast majority of the focus was on e and the data and, and you know trying to understand the the components of the e but i think recently there's certainly been a shift and more focus on on the s so it absolutely is something that we are um, that we look at both you know as we invest in, in across our own um, organization as well uh, I think the the data here is um, is still evolving, right? So I think there's, uh, you know, we are continually evolving and, and thinking about what are the right metrics to um, to focus on, and you know I think there are a couple that are again emerging as as ones that are, um, you know, I think more robust in terms of the data that's available, uh, easier to measure across the companies that we invest in. So these can be things like um, you know gender pay gap or uh, you know how much exposure do you have to controversial weapons. Uh, so I think this is a space that's going to continue to evolve. And again, we're looking at it not just on uh, in, in the sphere of how we invest, but also, you know, thinking about our own company uh, and thinking about metrics or targets that we might have, for example, for our um, executive team or for our um, the, the composition of our boards. Absolutely. So another point that I just wanted to raise, Raman, as well as, you know, this is more um, a business focused, I would say. Uh, one of the trends or uh, the rising trends that we have seen is uh, direct indexing. And um, this uh, very emerging trend, uh, I believe, can enable a very unique approach to construct a portfolio, uh, especially an ESG portfolio, by either including or excluding securities very uh, specifically based on ESG criteria. And uh, given that, what is your view on uh, sustainable investing as well as the direct indexing uh, strategies going in hand in hand in the future? And how do you think this will uh, shape up the uh, you know, sustainable investments, responsible investments uh, in the future in a big way? Yeah, you know, I, I think this is one area which, again, is, is evolving very, very quickly. And, and we're seeing um, a lot more demand because uh, I think, you know, you've seen obviously huge demand for index and, and passive strategies over the years. Uh, and what we're finding now is the next generation of tailoring um, that. So providing, you know, risk and return characteristics that mimic a particular beta strategy that clients want. But then, as you said, you know, either use, utilizing screens or having a methodology which tilts to higher ESG ratings or scores you know, using carbon tilts based on data. I mean, these are things that we're currently doing across some of our affiliates to produce uh, what we call sustainable equity benchmarking um, products. And I think actually it goes even beyond that because I, when I think about even on the wealth side, if you think about clients, um, you know, who are uh, wealth clients and as they're thinking about what they are looking for for solutions or outcome-based investing, it's no longer just about risk and return and, and, and meeting a particular financial outcome. It's increasingly about, all right, how are my investments actually producing a social outcome as well? And how can I measure that? So I think it's not even just in the traditional sort of index beta strategies. It's even how you customize a, um, an investment solution to deliver a particular outcome, which now incorporates non-financial metrics into a, um, a particular client's portfolio. So it's, again, I think it's early days and, and there's lots of innovation to come in this space. Absolutely. I think this will definitely start addressing the uh, client expectations on, uh, you know, really measuring the impact of their investments as well. Thank you, Raman. And to, just to conclude our uh, chat, uh, what do you think is the, um, you know, call to action for investment management firms to advance their ESG strategies? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's definitely a call to action here. There's there's lots to do. I think, you know, what we find is, you know, number one, you just need to identify what your priorities are. I mean, this is a vast space. You need to take stock of your key stakeholders and really say, you know, these are the key priorities that we want to focus on and emphasize. Uh, once you do that, again, as we were talking about before, you know, you need clear goals um, and outcomes that align with those uh, policies that you're setting. Uh, and then you also need uh, metrics to, you know, increasingly we're saying in hearing that not only do you need to have these um, these values, these goals, these priorities, but you need to prove them and, and back them up with with concrete data. 
Um, so that's important uh, call to action. And, and then obviously the, the requirements with, from a disclosure perspective are just, you know, increasing by the, by the day. So you can do all of this, but you have to have a very clear and effective and efficient uh, way to disclose and, and to report on how you're, you're doing all of these things. And that's going to be a, you know, a call to action for, for some time, I think. And thank you, Raman, uh, once again, and, um, and thank you for your very uh, insightful uh, you know, uh, session and um, the inputs that you gave. Thanks, Ubi. And uh, over to you, Catherine. Thank you, gentlemen. It's great to hear about the kinds of results that can come from a sustainable and responsible investment strategy. Let's move on now to our panel discussion. Zeeshan Rashid will be our panel moderator today. Zeeshan is Global Head Climate Change Advisory Industry Advisory Group, BFSI for TCS. Z comes with over 20 years of experience in trading, risk management, and consulting. He has authored multiple papers in risk management. He also wrote a chapter in the world's first crowdsourced book, the RegTech book, published by Wiley. Z holds a master's degree in business management and FRM from GARP. Welcome, Z. Thank you, Kathy, and a very warm welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining this panel discussion on sustainability, banking, financial services, and insurance empowers the world for a resilient future. It's my pleasure to introduce my panelists today, starting with Jean Bohm. Jean Bohm is Senior Vice President, Office of Sustainability Strategy and Direct at AAA, the Auto Club Group. Jeffrey Weaver, Executive Vice President and Chief Qualitative Risk Officer at KeyBank. Joining Jean and Jeffrey is Scott Beckerman. Scott is Senior Vice President and Head of Corporate Sustainability at CoAmerica. The difference between every other life form on humans is the fact that they change themselves for the environment, but we change the environment for ourselves. And that I believe is the core of the issue. The problems cannot be solved at the same level of awareness that created them as famously quoted by Albert Einstein. We cannot undo the harm that we have caused over the last 100, 150 years. But through increased awareness, we know we have an opportunity, perhaps the last one, to create a better world. And financial institutions have to play the sheet anchor role towards ensuring it. And that brings me to the first question to all my panelists. By controlling the flow and direction of capital, a financial in institution can drive meaningful impact through key domains such as lending, insurance, and investment. What are your views on this? Let's start with Gene. Well, thanks, Z, and uh, it's, a it's a pleasure to be a part of the panel. You know, I'll approach it from an insurance angle. You know, at AAA, uh, we are here to serve our members, and one of the benefits we provide our members is auto and home insurance. And you know, when you think about insurance uh, and the impact of sustainability and climate change, it's something that we've actually been wrestling with for decades. We have seen the impact of increased uh, weather events, whether that's uh, wildfires or tornadoes or hurricanes. Uh, and there's been, you know, a significant amount of work that's been done from a risk management perspective to ensure that you know, we have the capital in place to be there for our members. And so uh, there's still much more to be done in that space, but I think understanding the impact and seeing the rising um, cost of that impact is, is not new to us. I think what has been more new over the last five to 10 years in the insurance space is taking more deliberate action to really improve um, and address uh, the impacts that it's having. And so, you know, when, when you think about the insurance space, our ability to, um, you know, move to a purely digital solution, uh, purely paperless, uh, no touch um, when it comes to underwriting certain properties or adjusting claims, that's ultimately what we, you know, aspire to be able to do. Uh, and so, you know, I think that, there from an insurance perspective, there's really three dimensions. One is understanding the risk. One is doing things differently uh, to minimize the impact that we're having as an insurer. And then final piece is really advocating for resilience and resilience in uh, both automobiles, resilience in 
uh, the way that properties are developed. Um, so that's why we think that, you know, sustainability and addressing climate change is so critical to the insurance space. Thank you, Gene. Uh, very thoughtful uh, insights. So risk management, differentiation of the products and service and resilience are the three, three, three things you brought out from an insurance perspective. It would be good to hear th uh, the thoughts from Scott as well. Yeah, thanks. And again, pleasure to be a part of the panel. Um, I'll first maybe push back a little bit on the notion that, that banks control the flow of capital. I love a good analogy. Uh, if you want to think of that flow like a river, banks don't necessarily control the flow, but whether we're in the current with a lot of other business uh, floating down that river, and we want to work with those companies who we think can navigate that uh, current better than others. So when it comes to things like green finance, um, we currently have about a billion and a half in loans and commitments to companies that are supporting a greener economy. And we're supporting companies in a wide range of industries from what you might expect, uh, things like renewable energy and energy efficiency to recycling and even uh, landfill gas to energy and the myriad of consulting and engineering firms that are supporting uh, you know, decarbonization in our economy. And so to torture the analogy maybe just a little bit more, um, when it comes to the flow of capital, I think it also means that we don't just dam up the river and stop the flow of capital to companies that are in a more carbon intensive uh, industry or, or business. I think it means helping those companies that might be struggling to navigate this river of decarbonization, helping them really transition to a place that will allow them to be more competitive and, and to really flourish in a, in a net zero future. So I think that's uh, one of the roles that we have here with, uh, with the banking industry. Very, very good point. You, you brought out the point about collaboration. It's about working with the ecosystem working with your customers so that they can embark on their journey and as a bank you can facilitate them by helping them move from brown to green uh jeff over to you what are your thoughts i echo the sentiments of my pa panelists and uh say thank you for the opportunity to spend a little time with you uh so i'm at uh as you said key bank and KeyBank is, on, is focused on helping our clients and our communities thrive. If you think about the existential threat um, posed by climate change, and that really sort of shows up in two ways. One, obviously, the impact of the uh, intensifying and uh, sort of weather events that we've all sort of witnessed and um, the increased frequency of those events as well as uh, sort of the consequence of the uh, response to the need to transition certain businesses, uh, certain communities, um, the policies that drive the transition to a low carbon or no carbon economy. Um, there is a need to ensure we understand the consequence of that transition and the impact of the frequency of the events I referenced before um, on our clients, um, on our risk-taking activity, um, and on the obligations we've made to the various stakeholders, um, our investors, shareholders, um, our uh, business partners, um, our employees. Um, uh, we are uh, also, uh, like Scott, a regulated entity. Uh, so. Uh, regulators are interested in making sure we understand the impact of material risks like climate change on the way we operate and the way we take risks. Um, and we're able to articulate that. Um, and uh, we have the requisite uh, sort of governance and oversight in place uh, to ensure that happens. Um, from our perspective, um, to do that, um, we've developed what I would describe as a laser-like focus on building out a climate risk management framework that um, evidences the commitments I've referenced to uh, managing risk internally. Um, we, have, uh, not, we are not new to the notion of being responsible bankers. There clearly isn't enough capital um, to facilitate transition globally. 
um, but it starts with, um, you know, uh, our obligation to do what we can for our clients um, and to set a good example to our fellow bankers, um, as well as demonstrating responsible decision making and how we go about delivering that and talking about it from a disclosures perspective. I'll stop there. Wonderful uh, insights, uh, laser-like focus. That's definitely the need of the hour. Anything short of that and we will struggle. But with a laser-like focus, I think, I think we have a chance to build a better tomorrow. Gene, my next question would be to you. For a business with such diversified products and services, such as roadside assistance to banking, to travel, membership, what growth opportunities and challenges do you see for ACG and how are you preparing for the transformation? Thanks, Z. You know, for us, we always get our best insight from our members. And, you know, we are um, member focused and serving our members is critical. And, and, and as you reference, you know, when, when you think about the diversity of the benefits that AAA offers, you know, we're known first and foremost for roadside assistance. And, you know, I think that is quite frankly going to be one of the most challenging areas. You know, the effort that is required the emissions that are produced to rescue people on the side of the road every single day. Uh, you know, we are looking for ways that we can uh, minimize those emissions, both in terms of the efficiencies in uh, the equipment that's used to provide those services, but also in being smarter on how we deploy, deploy those, those services and continuing to find efforts that, you know, reduce the amount of incidents because no one wants to need to be rescued at the side of the road. But, but where I really see a lot of the, the growth opportunities are around you know, advocating for our members, which we've done for over 100 years, around safety, the increased usage of electric vehicles. Uh, we know that there's going to be a significant amount of transformation in that space. Um, and so, uh, which will uh, decline the amount of roadside incidents that are necessary. Uh, the other piece of this is as you know, a lot of conversation in the insurance space around autonomous vehicles. And, you know, while it's still pretty unpredictable space of when you'd ever get to full autonomy, the advanced safety features that are now being manufactured into vehicles is um, reducing the amount of claims activities in terms of the frequency, uh, not necessarily the severity of those because those sensors are more expensive to replace when there are incidents. But I do think with autonomous features that are creating a safer environment, I think we're going to see some uh, significant improvement in the safety that will reduce claims, that reduces emissions, that reduces the effort that's required to dispose of vehicles. So I would say, you know, the two key areas that are probably getting our most attention at AAA are around electrification and autonomy. Wonderful. And you brought up a very important point is about the insights from your members. Sustainability requires insights. Sustainability requires collaboration. And that can only come when you get insights from your stakeholders and build your products and services which suits them. And then, you know, you report it in such a way that appeals to them as well. So very, very important point you brought up. Jeff, uh, there are significant challenges with models and processes because they need to align with the climate factors to be able to generate climate adjusted numbers for 10, 20, and 30 years, something which has never happened in a financial industry before. Everybody's trying to figure out what is the best way forward. What would your recommendations be? I think a roadmap to better understanding of your vulnerability starts with um, a thoughtful understanding of your climate uh, sensitivities. Um, looking at various industry exposures um, in the form of maybe heat mapping to develop some sort of prioritization in terms of how one thinks about um, those industries' vulnerability to climate change, um, as well as looking at the consequence of climate change across the risk taxonomy. We all believe now that climate change risk is a cross-cutting risk across the seven or eight risk pillars is the way one begins to assess qualitatively 
um, the impact of climate change on the operating model of banks, as well, again, as those that risk taping, taking activity. I think that's later followed on uh, quite quickly um, by some, some sort of scenario analysis that looks at, and one could say this is slightly different, and, and, and others might say significantly different from what we know to be scenario analysis as relates to the traditional stress testing for capital. This is scenario analysis in the context of how one might think about vulnerability to economic profit changes that might be sudden. Um, and the best way to do so is to start small, qualitatively, and grow in sophistication through knowledge. So I would like to think that the first step would be understanding, maybe using some of the scenarios adapted by the, the GSFS, um, that I believe I have that right, in terms of the potential impact of varying scenarios that they've established on the credit portfolio and then the downstream consequences, for example, from an operational risk um, or a reputational risk and strategic risk perspective. And that could go on in terms of, the, again, uh, other risk pillars. Um, and using that to inform where you might prioritize stress testing. Very well articulated, I must say. I'll leave I you with want... one comment. So you may notice that I dodged the data question because that one is very difficult to answer. <laughs> um, it is it's taking a global effort to, to sort of figure out how one might acquire sustain data on a sustainable basis. Well, I won't let you dodge the question. There's an audience question which has come up on our screens and I will come back to you on that. So you, have, you can think about it in the interim. Scott, uh, the question to you is, sustainable firms will be profitable more profitable than what traditional firms are. Do you agree? What are the key levers which will drive profitability for sustainable firms? Yeah, absolutely, I agree. Um, I, I think historically the market has looked at sustainability as a proxy for good management. The theory was that those firms that were managing their environmental footprint um, were also looking at a variety of other factors which made them well-managed and likely to deliver higher returns. And additional value. And within the last year or two, if anything, we've seen an acceleration of that. Um, but I think it's going a lot deeper now. Firms that are advanced in their understanding and management of uh, sustainability are being recognized as being better uh, managers of those risks, as, as Jeff was discussing, um, related to climate change in particular. And perhaps even more importantly, the ability to capitalize the opportunities that come with them, um, and not just managing the risk, but, but leveraging the opportunity. It might be a little bit more difficult to get a initial quick read on companies that are actually more sustainable as everyone is rushing into this space and looking to tell a story. Um, but I think a bit of due diligence will show the companies that are really offering up sustainability metrics or pledges and trying to greenwash their way ahead um, compared to those that have really embedded sustainability into their business operations and strategies. Um, everything from supply chain to management of the firm's own footprint to really focusing in on how they can help their customers and meet those transition needs and the needs of a, a greening economy. Great. Uh, Jean, Jeff, you would like to uh, comment on this question as well? Well, I'll just add, you know, uh, one of the things that I'm really energized about is the global nature of us coming together as a world to try to address this. And you see it happening in the frameworks that are de being developed, um, you know, across industry, across uh, geography. And, you know, I think uh, that there's still a lot of maturing that needs to be done, whether it's the frameworks or the data capture. Uh, but yet, I feel like there is a lot of uh, focus and some of the, you know, the best minds are coming together on this. And so I think getting those frameworks um, correct uh, is an important piece of addressing this. The other piece I'd say, and this is, you know, part of the reason uh, Z, that it's been so advantageous uh, to work with you and your team is 
the insight that and the leadership role that TCS has played in this. And, you know, when I look at, you know, one of the reasons that it's been a real pleasure to work with you and the team is the the leadership you've provided on the business reference architecture around sustainability, because that's something that really gets beyond some of the uh, some of the more esoteric conversations and really gets into practical implications of how are you going to adjust your operating model to become more sustainable. So that's a piece that that I'm pr pretty excited about, you know, just some of, I'm glad that we're coming together as, you know, sort of one world to address this, but I'm also glad of the leadership that firms like TCS are putting out there to practically help organizations adjust their operating models to address this. We're honored to get those comments from you, Eugene, and we'll do our best to service you and, you know, make the better world in our capacity. Jeff, your, your thoughts, please. Um, I, I would say, you know, uh, there has been much made of the potential degradation or contraction of risk appetite uh, by banks and other financing, uh, in, uh, financial intermediaries as relates to the less the lower appetite for those industries that might be impacted by um, transition related risks. Um, I would say um, our organization, and I'm sure we're not the only ones, are thinking about this also in the context of the opportunity to be a part of the solution. Yes. Um, and you could make an argument that's, that, you know, maybe the duplicity in that is that it's both self-serving because we want to be profitable, well, we want to create value for our shareholders, but then also um, we want to be uh, very, again, uh, focused on articulating um, that strategy to our stakeholders, that we want to promote um, uh, uh, sort of sort of financing opportunities that enable sustainable uh, strategies for our clients, and over time, potentially even providing financing for emerging uh, technology solutions that support broadening sustainable practices globally. From your insight, it's very clear that sustainable firms will be more profitable firms going forward, though it's a theory for now, but all the great minds that we're talking across the world have directed us in that, uh, you know, in that way. And uh, it's not hard to think otherwise, right? Uh, and some of the research that we have been studying shows that sustainable firms may be able to be more than 33% more profitable than other firms. Now the question which Jeff wanted to dodge, and this is coming from our audience, data. We can do whatever we want to do, the great things on reporting, new product services, it all boils down to data. And when it comes to sustainability, there is a real struggle on the data. Some of our research shows that 30 to 40% of the data required for sustainability related you know, work that we need to do is not available. How do we work with this data challenge? Can we ever achieve data perfection in this field? And again, this question is for everyone. Uh, look, the reality is that um, the analysis I referenced before um, that is part of the climate risk management framework, some of the scenario analysis, um, all of that is fed um, by um, a growing desire to understand simply because the models hadn't been focused on this before. Um, not so much what's happened historically, but you know, in a nonlinear way, what could happen going forward and to, in order to have some of these scenarios that we've referenced, you know, the hundred year flood, which happens more frequently than that now, <clears throat> how that could, could come about. And so, you know, there's been lots of calls. I've been on a variety of consortium uh, efforts. I'm in a number of working groups um, where uh, there is a lot of focus on, you know, developing partnerships with nation states, various government entities um, that have on uh, these uh, massive amounts of data um, sort, of, sort, of, sort of collection efforts. Um, they're just observations, um, getting access to that in a public private basis. And there's it's developing a cottage industry of organizations that are able to pull that data together and create a framework for assessment. Very interesting, very interesting. Uh, Dean, your comments, please. 
Yeah, I would just add to that, you know, two things. One is when I think about data, you know, we really look at AAA of sustainability as being a team sport across the organization. And, you know, we're fortunate to have actuaries and data scientists and great people in finance and uh, audit and all of the different areas. And I think so internally, you know, I think that uh, bringing together our best resources on how we deal with data uh, will only get stronger. When you think about the data needs uh, externally, right, because I think that much of this relies on uh, data externally, I'm optimistic. You know, uh, when I think about uh, the amount of data that we're able to have that we didn't have, you know, five, 10 years ago across our business, not even just on the sustainability piece, whether it's telematics data for automobile uh, driving or electronic health records that can be accessed to improve life insurance. And I, I feel like when it comes to the environmental data, I think that we will continue to see maturing, we'll continue to see organizations that will get stronger at um, commercializing that data so that it can be used in a way to inform uh, better decision making and more sustainable organizations. Very interesting. Yeah. Data, we can't reach data perfection. We have to work with what we have. Very interesting. Scott, your thoughts on data, please. You know, we certainly hear a lot of uh, stakeholder cries for the improvement in data quality and reliability and comparability. And it, it is getting better and it's getting better quickly uh, and it will continue to get better. But I think one thing that we'll have to keep in mind is that we're never going to get to that level of data nirvana that our stakeholders are looking for particularly with respect to comparability. Um, companies will always want to report metrics and use models uh, that are, uh, are most advantageous and most material to their business uh, based on what their specific business plans are. And we have to be okay with that, uh, that the, the data will not be always 100% comparable. Uh, and that's good. Uh, that means people are using data in ways that, that make sense for their company. It's also easy to fall into the trap of not acting until you feel like you have the most reliable data on hand. Z, you mentioned, you know, we, we might be missing 30 to 40% of the data that we need. Well, that means that we've got 60 to 70% of the data on hand. So, you know, encouraging companies to look at the data that they have and see what it's telling them. It may not have the level of quality that you're looking for today, um, but you will certainly gain directional insight on, on where you need to go. Um, and then the last part might be that <clears throat> to manage all of this data, you really need the tools and systems uh, to, to support that. It's no small task. It's not something that can simply be done on a spreadsheet by spreadsheet basis. Uh, if you really want to get to that audit ready uh, data quality that stakeholders are looking for. I think that's the spirit we need to go with. What if we don't have 30, 40, 30 to 40% of the data? We still have 60% of the data and that's good enough to start the journey and data will be built as we go along. We're almost at the end of our panel discussion. I would love to keep going on, but then you know, time is against us. But before we end, I would like to get one line from each one of you in terms of what your call of action will be for the industry. I'm often asked the question, um, is climate change risk mitigation good policy or good politics? And I say neither. Um, it's the responsibility to understand material risks that impact our organizations potentially, um, challenges to uh, the broader financial system, I'll say limited to the U.S., and our obligations um, as it relates to this existential threat uh, more broadly. Amazing. Amazing. I mean, we, we've discussed this and this always resonates well with me and I'm sure it will resonate with the audience as well. Gene? Yeah, for us, to... it's been straightforward. You know, one of our core values is doing what's right. And so uh, that's what uh, our journey is all about and sustainability is all about. And and Z, before we wrap up, I do want to thank you for the invite. I also want to do a quick shout out to my dog Freckles for not barking during the panel discussion. So I will reward her after this. So, but thanks again, Z. Thank you. Thank you. Scott? 
I, you know, I, my words would be to continue on the path that we've started down that, you know, true sustainability is a long game. It's easy to get caught up in the latest policy or proposed regs. Um, and while we need to be prepared for what's coming at us, companies need to keep that long-term focus and, and combine it with those real discrete short-term actions that are going to drive progress. It's been really amazing to see how quickly uh, that companies have been able to pivot over the last year or two as we start to face climate change impacts um, and, and take it more seriously. Uh, and that gives me great hope. The last bit I would say for the financial services industry is to really embrace radical collaboration. Um, the industry will be stronger. We'll be able to make the progress that we need uh, when we work together. And I look forward to doing that. Perfect, perfect. I can't thank you all enough, Gene, Scott, and Jeff, for your valuable insights and views and the time that you spent with us today. I've taken down some key points that you, you brought out. You know, keep it simple, practical, collaborative, keep moving. You know, the greatest threat I see for our planet is the belief that someone else will save it. And all of you unanimously brought that point of collaborating, uniting to do and move ahead to do a better job. We should not overstress on the notion that we are protecting the environment. We must work with the belief that we are creating a sustainable organization, ecosystem in a world where the environment doesn't need any protection. And we believe strongly that financial services will hold the key. Thank you very much once again. Back to you, Catherine. Thank you, gentlemen. It's truly inspiring to learn about the ways in which the BFSI industry is contributing to global sustainability and resilience. Now, I would like to introduce Ram V for our closing remarks. Ram V is VP and Chief Technology Officer for TCS's Banking, Financial Services, and Insurance Business Unit worldwide. He is the custodian of TCS's BFSI Innovation Lab and works with TCS Labs and customers worldwide to incubate innovation ideas from exception to execution. During the course of his 30 plus years with TCS, he has led several large mission critical transformation implementations for TCS BFSI clients across the globe. Two of the TCS implementations that he has led have won Banker Technology Awards from the prestigious UK-based Financial Times Group, Banker Magazine, highlighting the complexity and business value delivered to clients. Over to you, Ram. Thank you, Kathy. Great sessions. The pandemic has altered our lives significantly and some of our work practices also have changed in the interim period. The period has also offered us a glimpse of a path to sustainability with a sudden drop in certain human activity per se, which has re-energized the entire environment globally. In the past 12 months, the so-called collective human harm or the man-made noise levels worldwide has reduced 35%. Now that the countries and economies are opening up, these noise levels are likely to revert back to the previous levels. But we have now heard nature loud and clear. For the first time in 30 years, the lower Himalayan ranges became suddenly visible in a city called Jalandhar, 150 miles away in the plains. The smog of the Esther years had hidden it completely and the pandemic had decided to, to bring the mountain range in its full glory. Similarly, in other parts of the world, in Venice, for example, fishes and dolphins swam freely in the canals for the first time in decades without human interruption or a threat from tourists or boats. Interesting news from around the world also showed wild animals such as wild horses, sheep, kangaroo, coyotes and jellyfish reclaiming and freely roaming around the suburban land and water areas of San Francisco and other cities like London, Venice, Cape Town, Adelaide, Haifa and other cities. The Economist reported earlier this year that billions of US dollars is being pumped into business of decarbonization. Decarbonization of everything from energy and transport to industry and farming and, and much more. VCs and investment firms 
corporate entities and startups are betting on climate innovation in a big way. Bloomberg NEF, a research firm, has estimated that last year alone, more than $500 was, was poured into energy transition space. With major experiments like the direct air carbon capture, the climate tech may yet help humanity avoid the otherwise disastrous future that awaits our warm planet. BFSI institutions and insurance companies are in the epicenter of making the right and the necessary investments are supporting the underlying risks by or creating products that enable the transition to a low carbon or a green economy. These sustainable investments are critical for assured business continuity and prosperity in the absence of which economies are likely to be put through a very negative and uncertain period. Some of our customers are trying to balance this by working with their investments to address the sustainable investment strategies, as mentioned in this fireside chat, and realigning portfolios with ESG considerations going forward. Before sustainability becomes a way of life, we need to change our DNA to reflect how we create products, how we manage our investments, and how we report it. The key points that I took from this banking sustainability breakout sessions are four in number. Number one is collaboration. Collaboration is required to walk this journey, meaning engage the, not only take the partners along, take our associates along, but also engage our stakeholders from whom we should also get a lot of good ideas. As one of the panelists also put, I think it was Scott from Comerica, banks don't control the flow of capital. They are in the water current along with a lot of business flowing down the river. He went on to say that we don't stop the flow or dam the river of decarbonization, but collaboratively work with all industries in this journey. The second point is keep it simple and practical, but have a laser-like focus and I would also add incremental outcomes to energize this journey. Number three is sustainability will hopefully mean profitability. I like the argument that better risk management mean, means keeping a good oversight on risks. Keeping an eye on risk will result in lowered unforeseen losses, for example, and make it more profitable. The fourth one is, let us not talk about data perfection. That was a point that was raised. And this, I felt, was a very practical one. We may have only 60% data. We may need internal data, external data. We may need to benchmark data with uh, competitors. But let us start with what we have. So these are the four points that I had. Finally, I want to bring to your notice that at TCS, we are making significant investments in innovation and creating solutions, accelerators, and tools. We would like you to gain from our global experience, interactions, and capability of the special initiative an advisory group. We would like you to walk with this journey and pivot our collective knowledge and work with you to push this envelope. Thank you for being with us and over to you, Cathy. Thank you, audience, for joining us today. And I do hope you have some important takeaways from the session. Lastly, may I please request you all to share your feedback through the survey widget at the bottom of the screen. This will help us in giving you a better experience at future events. With that, we will end our session today. We hope to see you all again soon. Until then, stay well and stay safe.